Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here from a blog to watch at Microlux Chicago, speaking with Spencer Liu of Aloha Watches. Spencer, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, so the most important question, why did you start your own watch brand? Well, it's a passion, and uh, I also wanted to share the Aloha spirit with my watches. What is the Aloha spirit? So I gotta look at my phone here to make sure I don't mess it up for all the native Hawaiians, but Aloha goes a lot deeper than hi and goodbye. Uh, the real deeper meaning to live with the Aloha spirit is to be kind, to unite, to be polite, be humble, and endure. I think these are great traits, and I also I'm trying to share that with everyone who likes my watches. Now you told me that you're uh, you live in Seattle. Yes. You are originally from Seattle. I am. So wh where did you, as someone not that far away from Hawaii, but adopt the Aloha spirit within yourself? Well, so part of my life journey, I was a former tech CFO of a very fast-growing company in Seattle. Uh, quit that job in 2015 and traveled the world basically looking for happiness. And I found it in actually not traveling and accumulating more things or experiences, but compassion, which is basically wanting yourself and others to be happy. And then I found Aloha ties into that, so that's where this all came about. So it wasn't like you were having a great vacation on the beach in Hawaii and you're like, my watch has got to say aloha on it. No, it wasn't that. Although well, I, have had some, story. I have had some good ones out there. But okay, it wasn't all right. <laughs> so at least you've, had, you've taken the watch to Hawaii and had a positive aloha experience. Yes, yes. Now, a lot of people, and we've talked about this, who start their own brand, mm -hmm. begin with the idea of I want something which doesn't exist yet. What did you want in a watch that didn't exist yet? That's exactly it, Ariel. Uh, I was looking for something that could be my everyday. So my everyday watch prior to this was a Mega Aquaterra. Uh, but it didn't have the GMT function. And the ones that do are a little bit too big, and I don't like the way they were designed. And so that's how I came up with this design. So let's talk about this watch. What is this model called? It's called the GMT-40. The GMT-40, and yeah. I'm guessing it's uh, 40 millimeters wide. Exactly. And it has a GMT. Yes. I'm glad the name <laughs> connects with the product right. like that. Yeah. Um, is this this is your first watch? Yes, this is my first watch. Okay, so let's 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 go through some of the elements here. Uh, we already know the functionality it has and the size of the case, right. but why this particular design? I'm seeing some interesting things here. For example, the GMT scale and Roman numerals. Yeah, What's that so, all about? yeah. So this particular model, the black version, has Roman numerals because when I was in Switzerland, uh, getting you know building the relationships with my partners and putting the watch together. All of the clocks in Switzerland, all the big clocks, have Roman numerals and they're gilt. So when I made this gilt version, I had to put Roman numerals on it. So there's a lot of inspiration from the world of watches. Yes. Um, is that something you knew? Did you know that you were going to be inspired? Or during the design phase, did you recognize that you really started with inspiration? Before you become original, you have to ask yourself what you like. What do you say about that? Absolutely. Uh, if you look close enough at this, there's inspiration from many of the nicest brands out there. Obviously, Rolex, Omega, Patek, the sun and the moon are on the world timer. So all of these things are inspired. Uh, but the challenge, I think, Ariel, which you know, is to make something unique and new, even though you're inspired by all these elements. And I feel like I've done that with this, even though it was challenging to do. When, when you launched your brand, of course, you, you present your design out there, you, you put yourself out there, this is an extension of yourself, mm -hmm. and of course you hope for the best, but you also need to begin with a message. Yeah. What is the initial message that you sent to the world, or at least we're hoping that you're sending to the world, about what this means to you and maybe what it should mean to them? Well, like I say, I'm trying to share the Aloha spirit, and to give you another example, uh, even though I'm far from being profitable, I actually donated a custom a watch to a charity. I made a gray sunburst version, only one on the planet, and it actually helped raise 25000 for a girls' school in Kenya. So this is just one way that I've kind of given back, which made me really happy to help them, and of course they're very gracious to have that gift. But it's just one way that I'm able to share this, I guess, my somewhat success with others, and that, again, makes me happy. And I think that's one of the keys to happiness, which we get caught up in consuming, right? And I went through that stage where I bought more expensive watches, but uh, they didn't make me happier. Uh, maybe short term by acquiring it, my ego got boosted, but it really didn't provide deep happiness. And that's kind of what I'm hoping. I know it's kind of ironic to do that with a very nice watch, but I'm actually hoping that 
this will be something that someone can wear every day. Maybe they don't have to, they don't feel the need to go out and keep buying more watches. They can just be happy wearing this and have that reminder of where really happiness, you know, where the really happiness comes from, which I've learned. Uh, and maybe that will help them in their lives, which is one of my goals. So I think that we are not the only people that has recognized that looking at a nice watch on your wrist can put a smile on your face, right? In fact, when a lot of people ask me, they're like, Ariel, what watch should, should I buy? And I'm like, I don't know your taste, but wear a bunch, and the ones that make you smile most consistently, those are probably good contenders. The point I'm trying to get to is that a lot of what we talk about in the world of independent watchmaking or just bigger watchmaking is a feeling associated with the product. We're not necessarily saying, you are a professional that does these things, this watch matches all your needs, you'll have a great time at it, and it won't break. We talk about other things like wanting to spread you know, positive feelings, happiness, or love, spirit. My question is, why do you think watches are a good vehicle for that? Uh, so one of the other keys to happiness is being present. Uh, and so to me, when you have a nice watch, one, you're not wearing a smartwatch, which is bombarding you with messages and driving you insane. Uh, the other thing is, is for me, when you look at a beautiful uh, dial, something that's nice, and again, you watch that nice sweep of that second hand, uh, or you examine the case back and you see the beautiful movement, right? And you see that working away. Uh, to me, that just gives you that moment to forget about all that other stuff that's in your head it just gives you that nice moment to sit there and kind of smile and appreciate that. So I think that's one of the things, just being present and in that moment. At least for me, that's what a nice, when I look at the dial, that's kind of what I get that reaction. Like, okay, everything's going to be all right, even if I'm having a bad day. What were the parts of the watch that came out to you the most successful when you first saw them? You had the designs and you were probably waiting and the first prototypes were coming. When you saw the final prototype, and there's different dials, but what were some of the things you're like, Yep, Spencer, we got this one right. We got this thing right, and I'm going to keep making sure that our watches from now on have this. What, was, what were those things? Uh, well, there's two things. Uh, the first was the quality. So for me, I went the best on everything that I could, right, in terms of my capabilities. And so with the fit and the finishing and how it looks, very proud. In luxury, you can always spend more, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but just very proud of that. And then the second thing was just that the, the dial, the way that it came out. And... Uh, even just talking to people here at the show, it's really funny because they look at it and go, it's fairly simple, but there's something about it that I really like. And I'll tell you at least what I think it might be. Uh, for me, one of the important things in watch design, and again, I'm a, a new guy, but for me, one of the important things is masculine and feminine elements. If you achieve all the great models, to me, have this balance of masculine and feminine. Tell me more about that. So, uh, for example, you know, batons and circles and things like that. Uh, so for mine, if you look at the outer uh, ring there, it's got the squares and the, the dashes, and that's masculine. Mm -hmm. When you look at the center, it's you got the sun and the moon, and then you've got the dots and then the circular date disc, which are more feminine. And then also with the GMT hand and the second hand, again, masculine and feminine. So for me, it was really important to achieve a balance of those elements. And I feel that that's what makes, you know, a nice watch. So, so you associate a gender with certain types of shapes. And yeah. it's the mixture that for you is important. Going too far in one direction creates... Uh, an exaggerated watch in one of those two directions. We've seen those. Yeah. We've seen watches where like, that looks too macho. I don't know what it is, yeah. but like it's it's almost it's almost like aggressively macho. Like I don't know who could wear that. Like there's something almost like obnoxious about it. Yeah. Even though that's not what the designer was going for. Right. And then sometimes you're right, adding those softer touches, which you call feminine, which someone else might call something else, yeah. helps bring it back to something which is soothing to the eye. Mm -hmm. um, what I think is interesting is how these design principles you're talking about, different people have different names for it, mm -hmm. but you, in your own vacuum of starting a brand, were able to pick up on some of them, probably having no specific formal education in that area. Correct. What else did you learn? I uh, <laughs> learned a lot. I uh, made a lot of mistakes, of course. Um, I learned that, uh, well, I don't know. Swiss made is very nice but difficult. <laughs> there are challenges to it uh, and versus having them more done in the U.S. Uh, but uh, overall, you know, it's part of the experience. And I'm grateful that I was able to get these to the finish line. So. What's a mistake that you're happy you made because it allowed you to learn something new? 
Well, I think the entire process has been good. Um, I'm trying to think of what my biggest... My, actually, my funniest mistake so far was I was so focused on making the watch and getting it to this level that I really didn't think about selling it. <laughs> and so when I launched uh, in June, I didn't really have many sales, but it wasn't because it wasn't nice. It's because I wasn't thinking about it. And then once I thought about it, I was like, oh, I think I need to start getting out there and selling this. So um, that was kind of funny. No, I mean, you have to put engineering time and effort and prototyping and experimentation into making a watch. And the same steps need to be taken to creating a brand and marketing and sales. Yes. So it's like you have to build a whole new thing yes. when you just finished building a complicated thing. Right. <laughs> So I, I totally understand that. Um, what are some more things about you and your background that help people understand why it is that you are compelled and, and connected to the Aloha spirit or this particular design? Um, I think just that, like I said, in my life journey, uh, I was, quote, successful, and I'm really grateful for that. But real success isn't that, right? So being a corporate guy, CFO, having stuff, you know, having more expensive stuff, one-upping my friends, all that stuff. It never really meant anything, right? It was just kind of an ego thing. And that's all. I think this is just representation that, one, it's possible. That it, I guess the other thing that I'm trying to do is inspire other people, right? Maybe there's someone out there that's like, doesn't like their job or something, and maybe they have a passion or something. And Go for it. I did. I don't know what I'm doing. I still don't know what I'm doing, but it's part of the journey, and I hope to inspire other people to do that, and I'm happy to help, right? Like we were talking about earlier, it's hard to find information, and some guys don't really want to help out. I'm totally fine you know, sharing reasonable amounts of information, but helping people along as well if this is one of their passions. So. Did you find it difficult to get advice or help or just some, you know, information about how to start your brand? Or was it a very entrepreneurial process? Yeah, it's, it's very entrepreneurial. I think it's tough. At least it was tougher for me because I have no connections in this business. I have no, I had no idea. Like, I literally started from ground zero. Um, I think some of the guys know people in the business, which helps, right, before they start. A little bit. Yeah, it, I, I know nothing. I, I didn't, but like I said, uh, so yeah, it was it was challenging. And some of the guys, uh, and I don't mind, because I know if someone reaches out to you and then they go look at my LinkedIn, he's a CFO, but what is this guy, you know, why should I go talk to him? It's not like I know who he is. So I'm not mad at any of those folks that, like, never responded to me or anything. I get it, like, totally understand, but... Uh, yeah, it's kind of, it, can, it was a little bit tougher probably than someone that already knew people in the business and had an idea of what was going people on. People don't appreciate the challenge it is to not just make a watch, but make a nice one. Yeah. There's, I mean, that's a whole other conversation, but the amount of times people have had good intentions yeah. with big budgets yeah. trying to get a watch that people like you and me could agree is like a nice watch. Yeah. It's hilarious how many times they fail. Not because, not for lack of trying. Yeah. All right, I got, a, I got a campaign idea for you. Okay. Since you haven't worked on that part yet. Yeah. You can advise people to buy your watch, right. quit their job, and search the world for happiness. How about that? Well, I don't know if that's going to go over too well with all the significant others that are attached to those people. Don't so. they want people to be happy, though? I think they I do. I would want my significant other to be happy, right? I, I'm with you on that. But my, my practical financial guy is saying... You know, maybe when the time is right, you could do that, and I could help show you the way on that, but maybe not right away. So. A watch as a tool <laughs> to help you do something crazy is a tool nonetheless. Fair enough. Spencer, what are the, the price points of these? And remind everyone what the models are and the variation. Uh, so right now, uh, I made both of the GMT versions. The, there's a blue sunburst style and then the black gloss dial. Uh, they are running 1475 and that's including shipping, so... Uh, anywhere in the United States. Great. And where do you go from here? Um, I don't know. We'll see. Hopefully, I'll be on more shows, and I'll hopefully some folks in the media will pick me up, and I can get the brand out there, and hopefully the people out there like them. Spencer Liu of Aloha Watches, thank you so much. Thank you.